bow our heads as we begin this evening. Heavenly Father, I thank you again that we can be together. I thank you that we can open your word because that's what it's all about. I thank you again for the scriptures. I thank you for the Holy Spirit. I thank you that, that you, you tell us what's going to happen and we can know for sure what is going to take place. I thank you, Father, because I know that you love us so much and, and that is what comes through. Anytime we open the scriptures, is, is it really is, it is a message of love and invitation to us personally to have a relationship with you. So, Lord, I, I pray that that is what will happen this evening. I, I pray that, that uh, what I say will not get in the way of what you want to say to, the, to your people tonight. And I just pray, Lord, that your blessings will be with us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Space flight. It's an amazing thing, right? Of course, the space shuttles were retired in, I think, 2011 or something like that. So space travel looks a little bit different these days, but there are things that are still similar about it. And interestingly, the goals with human space flight is always the same. Humans are interested in doing experiments on things like the International Space Station and trying to go to Mars and doing different things, visiting the moon. I, I've read that they're still planning on trying to go back to the moon, don't know when it's going to happen, and eventually they want to go to Mars, but... Yeah, you know, 2037 or something like that. But anyway, other people talk about colonizing space with enormous space stations. But you know the reason for all of those things? It's not just, just idle human curiosity. The reason that people are interested in space travel today and the development of technology to survive in space is the, the notion of human self-preservation. People worry about everything from asteroids to overpopulation or disease or if the resources on Earth were to be used up and space mining becomes necessary. And space colonization for a lot of people, very intelligent people even, is a way of kind of creating a human backup. But you know something? When you study the Bible, you learn something interesting. We find out that God gives us profound details that God has a plan and it is not up to human beings to save ourselves, which is great because we would never be able to save ourselves anyway. And God wants us to understand that he has a plan for us. As we study, we grow closer to Jesus. We understand more and more in a very real sense that he has a plan for us that is out of this world. And the, the human methods of space travel will not become necessary. We look to Jesus instead because Jesus is going to get us home. If we're going to go into space, it'll be by the power of Jesus. And he is planning an incredible journey with us past our nearest neighbor, the moon and the, the planets. And I can't name them all. Some of you probably could, but Mercury, Jupiter, Saturn, right? Yeah, Venus. There is Venus. I heard Venus. Uh, some people say Pluto isn't a planet anymore, but I, I still think it should be. I like Pluto. But anyway, but higher and higher past the, the nebulas and up through the open space and Orion and to heaven to be with Jesus because Jesus is in charge of our being drawn up what we're going to find out is the word rapture literally means to be drawn up. And we find out what Jesus says. He says in Revelation 22, verse 20, He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. And it's with gratefulness in our hearts for this soon is coming that we're going to dive into the topic for tonight. The Bible tells us that God has revealed his end time plan to us in these final days. And so we're building this foundation that's going to help us to understand a different, a, a kind of a difficult concept of revelation, but a very prophetic one. And we will continue to remember, and you'll see as we get continue into this study, that the central theme of revelation is Jesus. God is in the business of saving human beings, and he would move heaven and earth to have you there at his throne forever. 
Sure, when we look at Revelation, we see a dragon who is evil. And the dragon is determined and he's cunning and he wants to destroy humanity. But Revelation isn't about the dragon. We see beasts and they follow the dragon. They try to deceive humanity. They flex all the muscle they have trying to pull God's people down and to deceive God's people and to place them under the influence and the power of the dragon. Terrible beasts. But Revelation certainly isn't about them. The great prophecies of the book of Revelation focus on Jesus and the second coming of Jesus. So let's jump in. Revelation 14, 14. It says, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. Well, when the book of Revelation pictures the coming of Jesus, it pictures Jesus coming with a crown on his head as a king. Jesus has always shown that he comes as king of kings and Lord of Lords. And what we're going to find out, I'll just kind of give you, you could call this a spoiler alert if you want to, but what we're going to find out as we study the second coming of Jesus, that it's never silent. It's not a secret. Now we know that when Jesus came the first time, it was comparatively low key, but we remember that even then in Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 15, that we see a glorious scene of angels appearing as a mass and, and praising Jesus for what he is doing. It's a powerful event. I'm sure the shepherds that were around Bethlehem that witnessed that event never forgot it as long as they lived. But alas, Jesus' first coming managed to escape the notice of some. And there were plenty of people who denied that Jesus was the divine Son of God. But Jesus was and is and always will be the divine Son of God. And he is coming again. And we are studying that event starting this evening. And we will find that when Jesus returns in his glorious second coming, it's not going to be low-key at all. Everyone will see and will acknowledge exactly who Jesus is. The Bible assures us of that. And as we just read, Jesus comes with a sharp sickle in his hand, and he's going to reap the awesome harvest of the earth. The book of Revelation, in agreement with the whole Bible, always pictures Jesus coming in power and glory. So let's jump in. Verses such as Revelation chapter 19, verse 1. After these things, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. And then there's a powerful scene of heaven worshiping God. Revelation 19, verse 6, describes a great multitude as the sound of many waters and mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. I'd love to continue to read it, but just for the sake of time, let's jump to verse 11. And we're going to see this scene now of Jesus, and he is preparing to come. It says, Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. This is another powerful scene of praise because God's judgments against the great harlot and Babylon, the wickedness of this earth, are true and righteous. And all of the heavenly host praise Jesus because Jesus has seen the blood of his saints shed for the cause of Jesus. And they, they, the saints of heaven have seen their own Savior, Jesus, as he has come to this earth to shed his blood for people because he wants to save them from their sins. And the evilness continues and it grows worse and worse. And there's a praise in heaven taking place because Jesus is coming back as King of kings, Lord of lords, and as a righteous judge. He wants to bring an end to evil. Evil would seek to silence the people of God by force, by deception, by distraction, by whatever it can do. But now Jesus in his righteousness brings the conflict of Satan to an end. Now this doesn't mean that God is taking pleasure in punishment. We've read the verses about that before. But God is demonstrating to the entire universe that sin is in fact injustice against God and against his people. And God is taking all of the wrongs and he's making them right. The description continues in verse 14, Revelation chapter 19 still, verse 14. And it says, And the armies in heaven, 
clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Well, why does the Bible picture Jesus and, and this multitude following him on, a white, on white horses? What does that symbol represent? Well, in the book of Revelation, a white horse is a symbol of purity, victory, and triumph. And Jesus is described as he comes with a crown of gold upon his head and he's riding a white horse. Jesus now is pictured as a victorious general. He has won a great war. He is pictured as coming and he has defeated all of the forces of evil. And he has overcome all of the nations of the earth. This is a scene in Revelation. And there's another scene, excuse me, in Revelation 11.15 that shows this. And we're going to read that one as well. Revelation eleven fifteen, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. The coming of Jesus is not a quiet or a mysterious event. Jesus comes to reign over the entire universe. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. And that is the way his coming is always depicted. So we're going to introduce this foundational topic that we'll later build upon in another presentation, as I mentioned. And we're going to ask some very important questions. The first important question is, how will Jesus come back the second time? And another very important question, how can I know that I will be ready when he comes? Well, the Bible gives very clear answers to both of those questions. And ironically, as we answer the first question, it'll already do much to prepare us to answer the second question. So let's study the scriptures together. Remember in our previous presentation that we discussed that Satan is going to use some very cunning, very persuasive deceptions to try to lead people away from Jesus. And we acknowledge these deceptions and then we learn the truth from the Bible. The first one comes from the book of Luke. Luke chapter 17, verses 22. It says, Then he, and that's referring to Jesus, so you could say, Then Jesus said to the disciples, The days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. Well, what does that mean? It's, it's Jesus speaking. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. But as we'll see in this study, the words of Jesus also apply to us in our day as well. I mean, we would certainly acknowledge that, that we don't see Jesus face to face today, right? But we do have a longing for Jesus. We know that the world needs Jesus. And, and we sure know that we need him. And now in the next verse comes a question. Luke 17, 23. And they will say to you, look here or look there. Do not go after them or follow them. Well, what's he talking about? This is what he's talking about. What he's talking about is if, if someone says, I think that Jesus is here on this earth. I've, I've heard of him. Or there's someone claiming to be Messiah or Jesus. And they say, you know, you need to, to come to this place. Whatever that place may be. We don't know what that place is going to be yet. But you need to come to this place because he's going to appear there. Or he's going to be there. And he's doing awesome and wonderful miracles we can know that those claims are false. And the Bible is going to teach us how we know that. Because we believe that the Bible is warning us about this situation. And it's not because it might happen. We believe that the Bible is telling us, and Jesus was specifically warning his followers of this, because it is going to happen. And Jesus knows it. It is going to happen. There will be a deception. Continuing the study, Matthew 24, verse 26, puts it this way. So if anyone tells you, there he is, out in the wilderness, do not go out. Or here he is, in the inner rooms, do not believe it. There's the same concept. It's repeated both in Luke 17, 23 and Matthew 24, verse 26. To study further, Matthew 24, 26 specifically, where it says, if someone says that Jesus is in the Ermo, 
That's the, the wilderness. This is a, the definition of that Greek word. That it could be a wilderness. It could be a, a deserted place. It could be a remote location. Or I like how the King James Version and the New King James Version puts it, in the desert. I like that definition because we're in the desert, right? And plus we know that the Middle East is, is a lot of it is desert. So that could be where the false Christ shows up. Or by definition, by desert, it could be in Las Vegas, right? Who knows? We don't have any idea. By any other de definition, though, it simply means that it's going to be a deserted place. It's going to be somewhat of a remote place. It's going to be a solitary place. That's kind of what is being warned. Or it's going to be in, in the inner rooms. Some place that, that this is the, the key. I guess I need to, to mention this specifically. When they say the inner rooms, what that is teaching us is that you're not going to see this false Jesus unless you go to where this false Jesus is. Does that make sense? He's not going to just appear before you. He's going to be somewhere on earth and you have to deliberately go to see him. The word of God says, if you hear that, and you will someday, don't believe it and don't even go. Don't even go. If someone is inviting you, hey, you got to see this. It's really awesome. Say, nope, word of God says that's not true. Don't get curious. It's going to be very compelling. It's going to be very cunning. It'll be very persuasive. The Bible promises us that. But that's why the Bible is here, is to protect your mind. Don't go running off after them. Even if they say that he's in Jerusalem and he's doing wonderful miracles, we've got to refuse to believe it. And the Bible tells us why. The Bible says something very remarkable that we don't want to miss. It's from Matthew 24, 24. And it says, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Okay, so, so a, a false Christ, that means they're, they're claiming to be Jesus Christ, but they're not. A false prophet might be someone who's giving prophecies, but they aren't real. Or it could be someone claiming to speak for God, but they're not speaking the truth. It's going to be someone who's showing great signs. I mean, these are going to look like miracles to us. Does that make sense? We're going to think for sure this person has got to be legitimate because of the great signs that they're doing. But the Bible warns us, yeah, this false Christ is going to be doing great signs. Don't buy in. It doesn't mean anything. And the Bible tells us why. And then it says, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Do you know who the elect are? The elect are those who are called by God. Now, God wants to call everyone, though, doesn't he? So the elect are those who are called by God, but they have responded to God's calling by saying yes. That means that God's elect are those who spend time in their Bible each and every day. God's elect are those who put him above everything else in their lives. God's elect are those who do not want to be deceived because they want God to teach them the truth. They want the Holy Spirit to lead them into all truth. And they're very sincere about following God. That's who God's elect are. And this verse warns us that it will be so convincing that even God's elect, if it were possible, would be fooled by it. And that's why God says, don't even go. Don't get curious. Don't listen to it. Don't believe it. Stay at home and read your Bible. That's the much more important thing to do. You are adopted as his elect. If it were possible, he would fool even you. But you will recognize that this has to be a false Christ. It cannot possibly fit the description of the true second coming of Christ from your Bible. So even though it appears that the whole world is going for it, and probably the whole world is ridiculing people who continue to doubt, right? The Bible says even if the whole world is going after this thing, don't go. Because when Jesus' second coming truly takes place, this is what it'll look like. Luke 17, 24. We'll look at other verses, but this is an example. Luke 17, 24. For as the lightning that flashes out of one part of heaven shines to the other part of heaven, so also the Son of Man will be 
in his day. Jesus Christ will never appear on this earth as some kind of a miracle worker who is on the ground. Jesus will not simply hold up his hand saying, I'm the Messiah. The Bible is clear and direct. The second coming of Jesus is going to be like lightning that flashes across the entire sky and lights up the sky and lights up the earth as though it were the noonday sun. And Christ is coming down from above. He won't rise up from below. It makes a very important difference because individuals may impersonate Jesus even with what appear to be miraculous signs and wonders. And we ourselves, even in this room or, or watching on the internet, might find those manifestations to be very convincing because of the apparent miracles taking place. But know the truth. We know that Satan is highly motivated because Jesus' purpose is to save human beings. Jesus' purpose is about truth and about giving people choices. So Satan attempts to deceive people, and many are deceived. Satan is the great deceiver. He counterfeits the truth to try to lead millions astray and away from Jesus. And Satan's number one plan the goal of Satan is to get you away from Jesus. It's just that simple, and it's just that deadly. And that's why the Bible tells us exactly what the true second coming of Jesus is going to be like. Let's go to the scriptures again and continue to study the true coming of Jesus. The number one event, a, a thing to note about this event, is Christ's coming will be a literal event. <clears throat> the scriptures tell us, that Jesus will return just as he left. It's a story that takes place in Acts chapter 1. In this story, Jesus is there with his disciples. Now, in this story, Jesus has already died. He's already risen from the dead. And he's ready to ascend back to heaven. And Jesus is there and he's speaking with his disciples. And suddenly Jesus starts to ascend higher and higher and still higher until he's out of sight. And the disciples are gazing into the sky and they're trying to catch one more glimpse of their beloved master and savior. And Acts chapter 1 verse 10 tells us this, that there were two men that appeared in white apparel. They're apparently angels. And they address the disciples. And here's what they say in Acts chapter 1 verse 11. This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Well, it is a real Jesus that ascended. And that is something that can be proven, by the way. I don't know if you, if you have ever studied into this. If you never have, it's, it's fascinating. Besides the Bible, when people like to, to doubt the Bible, there are historical sources, actual historical sources that prove that Jesus Christ was real. In fact, there are those, <clears throat> excuse me, who don't even like Jesus, who still record that Jesus is real. And it wasn't because they were in favor of him. Some of them don't have anything nice to say about him, but they still serve as a historical witness that Jesus is exactly who he said that he would be. Jesus is a real, literal person. It can be proven, even if someone doesn't want to believe in the Bible. So it is a real Christ that ascended to heaven, and it will be a real Christ who will come back to this earth. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Christ's coming will be a real, literal event. Second, there's something else that the Word of God wants us to know about the second coming of Jesus. And that's that the second coming of Christ. Uh, of Christ will be a very visible event. We just read about it, it looking like the lightning shining from the east to the west, right? Across all of the sky. But there's an awesome truth in Revelation 1 verse 7. And it tells us, Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him. Even they who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. It's not just a few people. It's not just a few select individuals. Everyone is going to see Jesus. And we're going to learn a lot about the, the coming of Jesus and, and what that's going to look like. The resurrection 
of, of both the righteous and then the resurrection of, of the wicked or those who don't love Jesus. There's going to be a lot more that we're going to study about this. But we believe that the Bible makes it abundantly clear that every eye will see Jesus. All the tribes of the earth. There will be some people who will be very unhappy to see Jesus. But it's clear that there's nothing secret about the return of Jesus. So Christ's coming will be a very incredibly visible event. The Word of God also has something else fantastic to say about the second coming of Jesus. And that's that the coming of Jesus will be an audible event. We're going to hear it too. And that's something totally awesome because it, it leads us to some of my favorite scriptures. We go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and it describes the coming of Jesus. Try to picture how, how public this is going to be. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. What a glorious picture the Bible paints for us, right? I can't wait for that. But I believe that that's going to be a very awesome, very loud event. Thousands of angels. The Lord himself descends from heaven with a shout. It's a, a shout of triumph. There's the voice of an archangel. And there's the trumpet of God. It's a trumpet blast of victory. And if you want to know how loud it is, the Bible tells us. The Bible reminds us that the dead in Christ shall rise first. Have you lost someone? Have you rested someone in their grave? Maybe a family member, a, a mom or a dad or a grandpa or a grandma or a sister or a brother or, or a friend. God has not forgotten them. It's never left the mind of Jesus how much you miss them and want to have them in your arms again. And Jesus' shout of victory and the blast of his trumpet will awaken those who have been separated from us by death. And they will rise. The Bible tells us that. We just read it. The Bible tells us all about it. I can't wait for that study. We're going to study this more. There's some very important prophetic truths about that. But there's no other hope that has ever been like this moment in time when the curse of death is officially eradicated, is destroyed. And the scene continues to be described in verse 17. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. That's important. We will meet with our loved ones who have passed away before, and we will meet them in the air when we meet Jesus. I believe the scriptures are worded this way on purpose. When it says we will be caught up, that is a rapture, right? We'll be drawn up with our loved ones. And then the verse, 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, finishes this way. And so we shall be ever be with the Lord. Such a powerful verse, a rich verse. We are together with each other. We're together with, with our families, our loved ones. And we are all together for eternity. It's important to note, though, that we don't meet Jesus on the earth. The Bible was very specific about that. We are caught up in the air to meet the Lord in the air. We're not going out somewhere on this earth to see Jesus. Jesus is descending from heaven and he's coming to us. Which perfectly explains again why the Bible says in Matthew 24, 26, Therefore, if they say to you, look, he is in the desert, do not go out. The Bible says Satan will masquerade as Christ, working mighty miracles. The Bible says don't even go. Because when it's the real Jesus who has returned, he will come streaming down the corridor of the sky. There's no faking the way that Jesus is going to come in his clouds of glory. Truly, Christ's coming will be a glorious event. And it's something that Satan cannot reproduce. And we will know that we are seeing the real Jesus and that he is returning for real when we hear him shout, when we hear his trumpet of victory and we see the graves breaking open. 
And as Revelation 20 verse 13 puts it, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man, according to their works. Just to clarify, see, we usually just say Hades, but the, the true pronunciation is more Hades, and it literally means the grave or the place of the dead. Sometimes people equate it simply with being held, but that is actually not correct. It's used interchangeably, but that's not the case as we're going to continue to study in the future. But the point remains this. The graves break open, and people who have passed away come out of their graves and they raise up in the air to meet Jesus in the air according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and then we start to rise off of the earth and we meet them in the air that's when we will know we are seeing the real return of Jesus and as we meet Jesus in the air Jesus removes us away from this world always to be with the Lord don't be fooled by anything less the Bible is clear about the true coming of Jesus. The Bible brings no secret coming of Jesus into view here. No, instead, every eye will see him, whether they are happy about that or not. It looks like in that picture he's not terribly happy about it, right? But there are two classes of people on this earth. That's what we find out. I've talked about this also. You know, human beings are really good at, at dividing and subdividing themselves into categories and groups by race and, and by uh, their, their class, their, how much money they have, right? People are great by political affiliation. But the truth is there are two groups of people on this earth, the redeemed and the lost. That's it. That's all that matters. Human beings are all the same. The only thing that makes a difference is whether or not we have a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's it. All other divisions of humanity are completely false. And it's important to note that when Jesus comes in his clouds of glory, when we go to heaven with him, there are no do-overs. There are no second chances. The time to choose Jesus is right now. This evening, wholeheartedly, with an undivided heart. And we will be fully ready when Matthew 24, 30 comes to pass. And it says, And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So just for clarification, let's summarize the events. What happens when Jesus comes? Here we go. Number one, seismic upheavals. First, there will be a, a, a huge upheaval. Mountains and islands will be moved out of their places, and a great earthquake will shake this planet. In the last presentation, we discussed these events in connection with the, the plagues or the bowls of wrath of God, right? And especially the seventh bowl or plague was describing the scene of Jesus coming. And it, it was a huge destruction of the earth that took place. So that's the first thing that happens. And then the second thing that happens is that the righteous dead are raised. Remember, we just read that from, from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, letting us know that the dead in Christ shall rise first. So all of the people who love Jesus, who have a relationship but have passed away, are there, they're in their graves and they hear the, the, the trumpet of Jesus, they hear his shout of victory and they rise up to eternal life. And they raise up and they meet Jesus in the air. The next thing that happens then is that, is that we learned that our bodies are changed. Those of us who are still alive, that we meet up and, and, and meet with them in the air with our loved ones and with Jesus. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 51 and 52 talks more about that. And we're going to save that for a future presentation. But it describes how we're changed in the blink of an eye. And that we receive new bodies. It's awesome. I can't wait to share that with you more. But the next event then is immortality is bestowed. Immortality is bestowed. That means that we will be given the ability to live forever. God warned us with a human family before Adam and Eve fell that, that if they ate of the, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that they would surely die, right? We remember that the wages of sin is death. We know that death exists as a part of our lives, but it won't anymore. 
He will give us the ability to live for eternity. That means that we will have eternal life and we will know that. Then we know that the wicked living are destroyed. Now, I won't say that this is exactly in this particular order. I think it's very likely that during the seismic upheavals that there will be many who are probably destroyed during that time as well. But the point of, of putting it in the list now is to let, make sure that it is clear that there are not wicked people who continue to live on the earth after the righteous, after those who love Jesus, have been taken away to go to heaven with Jesus. Does that make sense? World will, the world will not continue business as usual without the, the righteous there. The wicked will not be alive after the righteous have been raised from the earth. And there will be a lot more descriptions of this. But we see this in Revelation chapter 6 as an example. It says, Then the sky receded. Okay, so that's another description of Jesus coming. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up. And every mountain and island was moved out of its place. Okay, so we recognize that. Those Certainly those are very congruent texts. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. The wicked shout this because they know that they don't have a relationship with Jesus. And they find his coming to be horrifying. It's terrifying to them. They are not happy to see Jesus. This is the worst imaginable thing that could happen to them. To look upon the face of Almighty God. And they are mercifully destroyed. It is what they want. And it is what they receive. But those who already love Jesus have no fear. Instead, it is the greatest day of our lives. Literally, the righteous welcome Christ. The righteous go to heaven with Jesus. This is the biblical order of events when Jesus comes again. But sometimes there are still questions. So let us consider some questions that are sometimes raised about the coming of Jesus. For instance, sometimes there's a question that arises when we look at this order of events, wondering about the verses in the Bible which indicate that Jesus' coming would be as a thief, right? Sometimes this verse is interpreted as a, a second or a separate coming of Jesus, which is not visible and audible, such as we've been looking at. Well, there's a couple of things to consider that we need to look at together. Uh, verses such as Matthew 24, verse 36. And it says, But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. So this is an essential part of that concept, that the day and the hour, or, or we would say the, the date and time of the second coming of Jesus, we don't know what it is, right? We can be anticipating it, and I, I think that we all are anticipating it. That's probably why we're here tonight. We're anticipating it, but we don't know exactly when it's going to happen. Well, let's compare this verse along with Matthew 24, 43, which is a significant verse to this concept. It says, But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Well, that kind of makes sense, doesn't it? If we knew that someone was going to try to break into our home, we'd want to be ready for that, right? Maybe we'd have extra locks on our doors and windows. Maybe we already would have contacted law enforcement in advance or something like that. But the key is we would likely do something in preparation for this event that we would not do as a normal part of daily life, right? Does that make sense? Like if we, if we, uh, when we go to bed, we lock the door and kind of whatever, go to bed. But if you knew a thief was going to try to break into your house tonight, you probably wouldn't just lock the door and wander off, right? You do something different. It's, it's something deliberate. We would alter our behaviors and practices in anticipation of this known event. 
But the key significance here is, if we knew that this thief was going to break into our home on, say, randomly September 5, 2025, whatever, we would be ready for that event. But at the same time, at least for some of us, if we knew that that event wasn't going to take place until 2025, we still wouldn't worry about it until it was about a week before or something like that, right? Well, it's the same thing with the coming of Jesus. That's what he's making a point about. He's making a point that Jesus comes as a thief of the night, and you don't know when that's going to be. Because there are some of us, some procrastinators, sometimes I'm a procrastinator, I'll admit it. There's some of us that if we knew Jesus wasn't going to come until then, some of us would not significantly alter our behavior right away until we got closer to that time. Does that make sense? And that was the very important point that Jesus was making. This is a very important point to Jesus. And that is his relationship with us. He, Jesus is saying, don't waste your time and your resources and your energy on trying to figure out exactly when I'm coming. Be ready for my coming right now, today. Now, why would Jesus say that? Because being ready for Jesus and being ready for his coming means that we have a close relationship with Jesus, right? We understand that. It means that we spend time with him. It means that we prioritize him in our lives. It means he's number one. And guess what? Jesus wants you to have that relationship with him today. Jesus does not want you to hold out for a later time and date before you turn your life over to him fully. If we're anticipating a date, then we might procrastinate. But imagine what we will miss out on by not having a relationship with Jesus today. He wants us to have it right now. So amazingly, we actually harm ourselves by not making the complete decision to turn our lives over to Jesus right now. That's why it's so important that we understand that when we compare the second coming of Jesus to the coming of a thief in the night, it refers only to the time and not at all the manner of the second coming of Jesus. Matthew 24 verse 44 speaks to this when it says, therefore, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. And then I had to save this one for last. Peter really kind of sums it up in a helpful way. And I think it's the best verse to tie it all together. He did an awesome job of this in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. When he really, he really just ties it together. And he says, but the day of the Lord, we understand that's the coming of Jesus, right? The, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. So Peter sums it up by saying, yeah, I mean, it's, it's going to be like a thief in the night according to the time that Jesus comes. But when he comes, it's going to be anything but a secret when he gets here. As we can see, the Bible explains itself. Another question sometimes arises, though, when the scriptures remind us that referring to individual people, that one will be taken and the other left. So let us also take a look at this passage. The reference is Luke 17, verses 34 to 36, and here's what it says. I, will, I tell you, in that night, there will be two men in one bed. The one will be taken, and the other will be left. Two women will be grinding together. The one will be taken, and the other left. Two men will be in the field. The one will be taken, and the other left. Well, what is most helpful in this case is a little bit of context. And that is because earlier in the very same chapter, Jesus had already compared his own second coming to the days of Noah. And here's what he said, Luke 17, 26, as it was in the days of Noah. So what do we understand when we compare the words of Jesus to the days of Noah as Jesus himself did? 
Well, in the days of Noah, we very easily understand that because of Noah, God's follower, the people of Noah's day were warned of the soon coming complete destruction that was to come upon the earth, right? But same as the second coming of Jesus, nobody knew exactly when that flood was going to take place. But there were important hints, such as those who knew of the ark and were listening to that warning could see the progress on the ark taking place, right? They knew when the ark was almost done. And then finally it was done. And the animals were divinely led into the ark by the hand of God himself. At no time did God ever say exactly when the flood would come. But there were hints that were too obvious to miss. Still, there were some who were very surprised when the flood came and they weren't ready. Whether the flood was being anticipated by people or not, still we would say that the destruction of the flood on the earth was not at all a secret, right? Not at all. This means that each person was given an opportunity to make their decision either for life or for death. And in the days of Noah, there was a choice. Either people got on the ark and were saved, or they chose not to get on the ark and they were not saved. Two verses later, Jesus also compared his second coming to the days of Lot. Here's what Jesus said, verse 28. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot. Well, what happened in the days of Lot? That's when the city of Sodom and, and Gomorrah, and we have a story specifically of Lot because he lived in Sodom, and it was completely divinely destroyed by God raining down fire on the city, right? Well, there were two choices to make. Two choices. Either you leave Sodom and you live, or you stay in Sodom and you die. You're lost. Two classes only. One was saved, the other was lost. Jesus wants to be absolutely clear that today the same choice is being made. When the destruction of Sodom took place, there was nothing secret about the destruction of Sodom, was there? I'm sure that it's something that could be seen for miles and miles around. But Jesus was making a very important part, point. You don't know when he's coming. And you can't always tell who is ready and who is not. But even as the followers of Jesus are being drawn up to him, those who don't love Jesus will be pleading for the rocks and the mountains to fall on them so they won't have to face Jesus. But it doesn't have to be that way. Our relationship with Jesus is what really matters. And crucially, there's no second opportunity. The time to get serious about your salvation is right now, this evening. Christ's coming will be a literal, visible, audible, glorious, amazing, joyous event. And the coming of Jesus is going to be very soon, and I can't wait. Can you imagine? The Bible describes for us that the earth is illuminated with the glory of God. The ground rumbles, it shakes, the lightning flashes, the thunder crashes, the sky is filled with 10,000 times 10,000 angels. We hear a shout of victory from the lips of Jesus himself. The angels are singing an incredible choir of Jesus, our Redeemer and Overcomer. There's the sound of the trumpet of Jesus. Graves are bursting open and the dead in Christ are rising into the air. And there's no sign of their age or sickness. And then our poor mortal bodies, which are subject to disease and death, we receive immortality. Our bodies are changed. Again, we're going to study that more. And we're caught up in the air. And instantly we are transformed. We are changed. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And we radiate with health and joy and gladness and happiness. And we cry out with the words of Revelation 15 verse 3, which is great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. And families are reunited, husbands and wives and babies and children, grandmas, sons, daughters, friends. 
grandpas, people from all ages together, shouting, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. And we are so close, friends. We are on the edge of eternity. This world simply cannot continue on as it has. It's like we're watching the ark being built right before our eyes. The ark is eventually going to be done. The God's followers are still being led by his divine hand. But I don't want this world to keep on going any longer. Do you? I want it to end. Jesus told us in John 14, 2 and 3, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. There's only one thing that can satisfy today and forever, and that is Jesus Christ. And I'm looking forward to that day. This is what Revelation is all about. And I say it again, Jesus would move heaven and earth to have you there. There's nothing in this world worth missing heaven for. It's not a fairy tale. This is reality. And sometimes we have to think about that, don't we? Because we're used to being exposed to things like TV shows and movies and, and, and the world of, of make-believe almost melds with our world of reality so closely that sometimes we have to stop and think, this is reality. This is going to happen. We are going to see Jesus come with our very own eyes. We are going to hear him with our very own ears. This is coming soon. And we are in the right time and place to be studying the scriptures about Jesus. And I want to ask you to respond to Jesus this evening by saying, I choose to place my affections upon Christ rather than the things of this world so that I will be ready for the soon appearing of Jesus when every eye will see him. Let's bow our heads together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the promise of Jesus coming. I thank you that you describe this event for us so vividly that, that you will come as a victorious general. You will come in righteousness. You will come in purity. You, you will come to do the right thing in a world that does the wrong thing. You have overcome this world. And you invite us to be part of you for eternity and your kingdom for eternity. And Jesus, I pray that that is the decision that each one of us will make. As each one of us is here and our, our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed and, and we are praying before you, Lord, this, this is a prayer that I make to you and I pray that each one of us individually will speak to you now just between our heart and yours. Individually, no other person needs to be involved in this. And I pray that each one of us will make a commitment to you that we know that your coming is soon and we want more than anything to give you every part of our lives. Anything that we might be holding back, I pray that we would give it to you tonight. I pray that we would be ready when you come again, that Satan will not have a handhold or a foothold anywhere in our lives. I thank you so much for the description of, of you coming and, and the promise that, that the pain of this world and, and saying goodbye to loved ones and, 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 and the sorrow, the difficulty, the, the challenges of this world all comes to an end. There will be no more hospice in heaven. There will be no need for a hospital chaplain in heaven. There will be no more goodbyes. Instead, we will live with, e with you for eternity, eternal life. Jesus, I pray that that day will come soon. And I thank you again for each one that is here. I thank you for those who might be joining us on the internet. And Lord, I just pray now, right now, that you will come into our hearts, that you'll come into our minds, that you will make the difference in our lives that this world could never make. And I pray, Lord, that we will continue, each one of us here will continue to study your scriptures individually. That's what these presentations are for, is, is merely as a catalyst to get each one of us individually into the Bible for ourselves, to study these things ourselves. And I pray so much, Lord, that you will prompt each one of us to spend time with you each and every day, just us and you in the Bible. And Lord, I thank you that you have graciously invited us to this time and place, 
that you have promised us. You've given us prophecies, amazing prophecies. So we will know that your coming is soon. And Satan will not be able to deceive any of us. We are your elect, Jesus. You are calling to each one of us. And I pray that each one of us individually right now will say yes to you, Jesus. And we will not be fooled because we know our Bible and we know you personally. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.